Um, okay, now I'm going to introduce Dr. Todd Davenport. Um, maybe that's it. <laughs> All right, so maybe I will, Todd, would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I could do that. That's fine. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, so how cool is it to get applause just like when your when your name is read? My goodness, like um, here I was trying to get after my kids to be quiet so that when I start talking, they you won't have a whole lot of background noise. And I diverted my eyes from the live stream for a minute when 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 Daria was talking, and then I come back and my my picture's up there. <laughs> so I was it's like whoa. Um, so thank you for for that kindness, and that's certainly something that that we, we continue to earn um, as, as we move forward in, in working with people who are, are living with these, these um, challenging, you know, complex conditions. Uh, my name's Todd. Uh, I am, I'll, I'll get into a slide here that discusses a little bit of who I am. I, the title of my talk today is uh, what to do when working out isn't working out. So I'll be talking about the physiology of post-exertional symptom exacerbation or post-exertional malaise, which, uh, which Daria uh, went over and did such a capable job of talking about from uh, the person who's experiencing it. Uh, so now we'll talk about some physiological insights, but not only that, we won't leave it at just the egghead stuff. We're gonna talk some nuts and bolts about how clinicians can start to actually provide support and help for people who are living with conditions that involve post-exertional symptom exacerbation. So um, just really quickly wanted to acknowledge that uh, I paid attention to the word cloud this morning as it was developing and um, connection and knowledge are the two items that came forward as being really important to all of you in the group. Um, so that comes back to Rajam, I think, and the culture that she's cultivated around this conference and just so grateful for that, uh, that combination of, of connection and knowledge. Um, of course, I'm not in the room with you, so there's minus 5,000 points for connection. <laughs> so hopefully we can still make it through uh, and that we can have some good knowledge as we go forward. Okay, so I forgot to start my timer because I want to stay on time. So we'll do that. Done. Okay. So uh, here are the hats that I wear. Um, I'm professor and vice chair at University of the Pacific, uh, their doctor of physical therapy program, which is located in Stockton, California. Northern California, east of the Bay Area, where we make and grow stuff, not where the pretty bridges are. Um, I'm also a physical therapy clinical specialist at Kaiser and Stockton in outpatient orthopedics, um, and also a research consultant with the WorkWell Foundation, uh, which is an affiliation that will become relevant uh, I think as, as we go through the slides and then also uh, an education co-chair along with Daria with long COVID physio. So I don't have any financial or non-financial conflicts related to this talk. And I speak on behalf of myself and not my employers or affiliations unless they want to take credit for it. So um, session objectives include uh, what I, what we promised to go over. So we'll differentiate between post-exertional symptom exacerbation and expected conditions to physical activity and deconditioned people which was a question in the chat from Darius' talk. So hopefully uh, the folks who are wondering a little bit about that will have a better understanding uh, at the end of all of this. We'll also compare and contrast selected metabolic cardiac and ventilatory responses to exercise in people with post-exertional symptom exacerbation and deconditioning respectively. We had to make some decisions about what to go over. So I will obliquely discuss the harms of graded or quota-based exercise in people with PESE. Um, and then we'll also spend more time talking a little bit more about the indications and basic principles for what we're calling energy system first aid uh, for people with post-exertional symptom exacerbation. So a full agenda. So having dispatched with the pleasantries, let's go get it. All right. So here's our session outline. Uh, what's what we're going to talk about post-exertional malaise. What is it? We'll talk about the underlying physiology. And we'll uh, start to talk a little bit about how we uh, provide care uh, in italics uh, for people with, with post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation. So what is it? All right, so it's not just fatigue. And I think Daria did a great job of going over the fact that we just don't have words uh, as allies, people who are not living with the condition to, to um, 
to discuss how bad this is and how functionally impactful this is. It's not just fatigue, it's bonked. Um, it's marathon runners that collapse across the finish line and just cannot move. But instead of after having run a marathon, it's maybe uh, after showering uh, or after having prepared a meal or uh, after a, a work day, uh, uh, you know, even an abbreviated work day. Uh, in addition, uh, post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation is associated with a whole host of other symptoms that seem unbelievable in response to activity or exercise, like breathing problems, cognitive dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction meaning um, limited attention, limited short-term memory, uh, limited long-term memory, uh, headaches, lightheadedness, muscle pain and nausea, uh, sometimes vomiting. Um, and so you have a whole host of these different symptoms that you just don't associate with activity or don't associate with, um, you know, having done a, a bout of exercise or just, it just seems unusual, kind of incredible, you know, at first when you're first starting to, to listen. This is a uh, study from about 12 years ago from our group uh, where, in which we co compared uh, 23 uh, women with uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and 25 women uh, who were matched to activity level. Uh, so so these, these folks would have been relatively, these folks would have been deconditioned um, and also um, matched to age and of course to, uh, to gender. And so what you, what you see are the symptom reports, the symptom responses after a maximal cardiopulmonary exercise test. Uh, and I know that the, the word cloud indicated that there are a lot of physical therapists in the, in the room, uh, some, some PT students in the room. Uh, you know, so there's an there's a understanding among some that of, of the cardiopulmonary exercise testing. But basically what we do is we, in a cardiopulmonary exercise test, we, we cycle to, to exhaustion. Uh, volitional and physiological exhaustion. So this isn't just sort of uh, spinning on the Peloton. <laughs> this is this is uh, you know yelling at people to get best effort. This is um, you know a lot of sweat uh, and uh, having a having a bucket in case somebody vomits afterwards. So these these are not these are not you know the the standard um, go to the gym ride the bike kind of things. Um, so, the, so maximal effort is what we're after. And you can see in the control subjects, this, uh, number one symptom, which is fatigue. Well, that makes sense because they're, they're tired and they're immediately following. They were tired. Um, and then the next day you'll notice that the, the next day that box is smaller. And then by the time we get to one week, which is sort of the third in depth, um, then you don't have anybody. Uh, and then you also have people with uh, muscular pain. And so that you have muscular pain immediately following the exercise task totally makes sense. You have fewer the next day, maybe they're stiff and sore and maybe like one person uh, who's still feeling it a week later. Um, and then you have, you know, some, some people have headaches, nausea, weakness and instability, but you know, that, those, those tend to go, go down over time, you know, and then, you know, insomnia, sore throat and swollen glands, we don't see any of those, you know, those stay flat. Um, but for those folks with, with MECFS, um, you know, right off, right out of the, right off the bike, uh, fatigue, which is similar to controls, but look what happens the next day. They're still fatigued, just as fatigued as when they got off the bike. And even, even a week later, um, also lightheadedness, which was not an issue with the folks who are deconditioned, but here we see lightheadedness, uh, just getting off the bike and, and then beyond. Uh, so people are still a week later, uh, still lightheaded, um, muscular and joint pain. So right off the bike, a few, but we noticed that, you know, instead of getting better over time in the controls, we see people getting worse over time. Uh, and the same thing for cognitive dysfunction. Uh, we see that more prevalent over time. So there's symptom amplification. Not only are these symptoms unusual, but they're amplifying over time. Uh, headaches stay relatively the same. Nausea tends to trend downward, uh, but is more frequent in people with ME compared to controls. Uh, the weakness that you see uh, folks getting off the bike, it gets better, but it kind of levels off. Uh, and then you have folks out here with insomnia, sleep dysfunction, and swollen glands. And you weren't, we didn't see those with our control subjects. So 
there is an unusual response to symptom response to exercise uh, that's characteristic of post-exertional symptom exacerbation or post-exertional malaise. And in fact, in this study, we found that within 24 hours, 85% of our sedentary control subjects indicated that they had recovered to their baseline, but 0% of our subject with MECFS did. 15% of controls, the last 15% recovered within 48 hours, but only one subject within it with MECFS recovered with, within 48 hours, and the other 24 uh, were still symptomatic. And so the time to recovery seems to have good uh, value to differentiate uh, between people who have um, post-exertional symptom exacerbation and uh, what we would expect from uh, a, a person who's deconditioned. This is a study by Dr. Lily Chu. This is a questionnaire study. Uh, Dr. Chu set out to understand uh, <clears throat> the pat symptom patterns of post-exertional uh, malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation and, and using questionnaire methodology. Um, and so what you'll notice is that there are some, some predominant symptoms. So, and so you have fatigue, which, which we said was, was not just fatigue, but it's bonked. It is like literally need to lie down and rest, and that won't be good enough probably for a while, uh, as we'll see in the next slides. Poor concentration, difficulty thinking and muscle pain, uh, at sleep disturbance, and even down here, flu-like symptoms, sore throat, tender lymph nodes. Uh, and so we have just, again, this whole host of, of different symptoms that are just unusual responses to exercise. We just don't expect these in people who are deconditioned. Part of Dr. Chu's analysis was she looked into um, the likelihood of respondents reporting that physical or cognitive exertion brought on a symptom versus emotional distress. And uh, overall, physical and cognitive exertion tended to bring on more of these symptoms than emotional distress. Uh, and you know, so here again, uh, as a general rule, we think that this is a physical, uh, you know, this is a kind of a, a more of a physical thing than we think of it as an emotional thing. So we're not thinking anxiety, depression, exacerbation of a pre-existing mood disorder. Uh, although those things are possible, we're not thinking about those as drivers of post-exertional symptoms. Um, so how long do they last and how, uh, how long does it take for people to kind of know? Well, here's Here's the length of time it takes for people to, um, you know, have uh, post-exertional symptoms after an exertion. And so um, really the rule is that it varies. Uh, generally speaking, uh, kind of the most common was either immediately uh, or maybe up to 24 hours later. Um, you know, there are people that don't know. Uh, and so you have to watch out for folks clinically uh, in order to help, help try and identify those cause and effect relationships between exertion and post-exertional symptoms. How long do they last? Well, you know, here again, <laughs> the rule is <laughs> it can vary. So a plurality of subjects said that it would vary. And, um, you know, generally speaking, you're looking, you know, anywhere from, you know, two days to, to kind of three to seven days, uh, but watch out for these folks that are that are more than a week. Um, you know, so post-exertional malaise does tend to uh, sort of come on. It tends to stay on for a long period of time, although the presentation can be variable, maybe for reasons that we'll talk about when we talk about the underlying physiology. Um, but that just as a clinician, it's really important to understand that uh, everyone is going to be a little bit different. And so um, a really important part of what we do is gonna be to help people identify some of those patterns. Here's the symptom experience. This is work from our group uh, after cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, so we have induced post-exertional malaise as part of the methodology. And then uh, we basically give people an open-ended symptom, uh, uh, open symptom questionnaire to let us know how they're doing. Uh, and here are some quotes, and I think they're really instructive. So it really puts the lie to the whole fatigue thing uh, being, being adequate to describe what's happening. Physically drained, mentally spent, foggy sensation. Felt like I was in a barrel and rolled downhill. Felt like I'd been through a trauma, hit by a Mack truck. All week, 
just couldn't find enough energy to get going for the day. Uh, trouble holding head and body up, had to recline as much as possible. Terrible headaches, felt like someone had struck the back of my neck with a baseball bat. Uh, so here again, you know, when, when, we, when we hear people talk about the, the symptoms that they're describing and, we're, and, and the, uh, that they're functioning despite of, or that they're trying to, trying to go out of their way to prevent, uh, which is kind of the, a, key, a key piece to Darius' talk, uh, you know, this is, these are the narratives that underlie that. Uh, so often when people ask me, you know, what I research as a faculty member, I'll tell them I research, uh, forms of chronic fatigue and they'll go, Oh, thanks for doing that. I'm tired. You know, I take a nap, <laughs> have some coffee. You're like, no, <laughs> that's not it. Uh, and so here again, this kind of, this, this is, this adds some important context, uh, to the words that I, I just don't think are adequate to describe how bad this is. Um, I also like to talk about uh, Hannah Davis's group study, uh, similar to, to the one, the, similar to Daria. And the reason I like to do it is because it was patient led. Uh, and so much of this work is patient led because clinicians just aren't listening uh, and can do such a better job listening and, and, and just uh, and you know, providing credibility to the patient's perspective. But again, long COVID is more than just tired. So it's Sure, it's, it's fatigue and it's post-exertional malaise, but it's all this other stuff that you just don't expect, you know, in terms of systemic symptoms. Um, you know, it's, it's also shortness of breath and dry cough and breathing problems. And, you know, the scary stuff, this stuff is scary. Uh, you know, the palpitations, the pain, the burning in the chest, am I having a heart attack? Do I have heart disease now? Um, and, um, you know, up here with the systemic, you know, uh, portions, do I have COVID again? Um, this is, this is the, you hear this a lot from patients, uh, and some of this is, is associated with that long COVID picture. We also know that the prevalence of symptoms tends to change over time, uh, where fatigue tends to start common and stay common, and post-exertional malaise kind of starts um, relatively uncommon and gets more common over time. So we know that about 10 to 30% of people uh, with um, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection will go on to demonstrate uh, long COVID. We know that symptomatic and asymptomatic infection uh, can cause long COVID. Uh, we know that long COVID is uh, prevalent mostly in mild cases that didn't go to the hospital, weren't intubated, not in the ICU, um, and uh, certainly didn't die. So it's um, you know in this in this nether region between um, you know between killed and recovered. Uh, which, you know, as a person with an MPH uh, and an epidemiology background, it's just so easy to count people who are, who have died and who have recovered. It's just really hard to, to, um, to get a handle on, on disability. Um, down here, cardiovascular, in terms of cardiovascular uh, responses, uh, you definitely do see more pal palpitations, tachycardia, uh, over time. Uh, and, you know, the pulmonary uh, component tends to get less frequent over time, but I would, I would imagine that with long COVID, uh, at least in our experience, it's, uh, the pulmonary manifestations are still uh, very relevant compared to long other things, long uh, Epstein-Barr virus, for example, um, or long mono, uh, long enteroviruses, long herpes viruses, uh, which have you know, kind of composed the world of MECFS. We also see uh, different phenotypic shifts. It's this third cluster that I want to I want to highlight here because it involves post-exertional malaise. Um, it becomes more common over time. You see uh, again cardiovascular manifestations that occur with this uh, brain fog and memory issues, uh, which are which are uh, a huge just a huge issue. Uh, you definitely see neuralgias um, and chronic pain syndromes that are uh, kind of co co associated with this. And then uh, again, the thing that seems to tie this cluster together, at least uh, in our experience with long other diseases is post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation. In order to make sense of some of the, uh, some of the, um, uh, the sheer number of symptoms that we see, uh, we've, we've kind of created a clinical typology uh, at the WorkWell Foundation. It's, it's primarily based on our observations of people uh, recovering from uh, exercise challenges. Uh, we, we, we have staged post-exertional symptoms from the immediate, the short-term, and the long-term. Uh, the short-term are really 
you know, a, a magnification of maybe what, what we would consider to be a typical response, uh, fatigue, out of breath, dizziness, and nausea. Um, again, these resolve quickly for people who, who don't have post-viral syndromes, uh, but they tend to worsen over time uh, or stay, stay, uh, stay bad uh, in people who do. The short-term PEM uh, tends to last, you know, we think two to four days and reflects overdoing it, uh, particularly those activities that exceed the anaerobic threshold that we'll talk about in a moment for an extended period of time or multiple times during the day. Um, these symptoms are muscle and joint pain, uh, cognitive dysfunction or brain fog, uh, headaches and sleep disturbances. And we think that these symptoms reflect you know, more of a neuro neurological response and, and, and dysfunctional cardiopulmonary response. And then finally, long-term PEM you know, lasts a week or more and really reflects a sustained immune response that's consistent with um, aerobic system damage. And again, we'll get into the physiology here in a moment, but the signs may include things like weakness, decrease in function, flu-like symptoms. This is, these are your fevers and your chills and your swollen glands and cardiopulmonary uh, symptoms. And so based on the symptoms that people report, you almost can um, identify sort of the degree of functional overuse that the patient may be ex exhibiting. Okay, so we're going back to Dragnet, just the facts for a clinical summary. Uh, again, uh, post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation is more than just tired. Uh, we don't have the words to describe what this is. It's severe, it limits function, it, there's a fluctuating pattern, and there's multiple symptoms that affect people, different, different people differently. Uh, and so the variability tends to be the rule. Uh, and we see that post-exertional malaise and post-exertional symptom exacerbation is not present in people who are deconditioned. So this is not deconditioning. This is a completely different response. All right, so what's happening with the uh, physiology here? Well, we use a test-retest paradigm that we call the Stevens Protocol uh, in which we, uh, we provide uh, the, the client with uh, pre-testing questionnaires. Uh, do, a, do a medical screening, uh, do a, a first cardiopulmonary exercise test, and then 24 hours later, we do a second cardiopulmonary exercise test. And the reason that we do this is because that first test uh, kind of gets everyone more towards the same, same level. We're kicking them into their post-exertional state. So I'm always very respectful of this, that the data that I present is going to be based on people who um, chose to become symptomatic. Um, you know, for, to understand this better. And I'm just so deeply grateful for that, um, that it's, they, they knew they were going to feel bad. They did feel bad and we're just doing our best to learn from, learn from it. So there are various different criteria to achieve a maximal test. And I, I won't thoroughly nerd out here, but I will nerd out just a little bit, uh, because you have to have a plateau in oxygen consumption, uh, with an increase in workload. There needs to be an RPE or a rating of perceived exertion. Of, um, of greater than 18 on that six to 20 scale, uh, a respiratory exchange ratio, uh, which, which really has to do with the, um, um, the, the rebreathed gases that we measure, it needs to be above 1.1. We do not measure blood lactates uh, because we don't like sticking people full of needles if we don't have to. Um, we, it's important to know that the patient doesn't know these criteria beforehand. And the um, probably the criterion we put the most stock in really is this RER, because you can't fake that. There's no faking it. Um, and that's why we consider it maybe to be the most valid. We use cardiopulmonary exercise testing to detect small changes in status between days for a whole host of different uh, populations. And I put them up on the screen, so I won't read them to you, but just a ton of different conditions. And people, people with these conditions can reproduce an exercise test within about 8% uh, of their values. And so really failure to reproduce a maximal test is unusual. We expect people to get on the bike two days in a row and do basically the same. And in fact, maybe even do a little bit better on the second day because they've been through the test once, they know what it's like, and they have some biomechanical efficiencies that maybe they've picked up uh, along the way to, um, to be able to do a little, a little better. Just a note to say that, um, you know, we see less reliability in people with ME-CFS, but if we measure reliability in a certain way, 
we see that people are able to maintain their ranks within their respective groups. So that means that while there's fluctuation and a lack of reproducibility, there's a sufficient amount of, um, of relative reliability between uh, people with MECFS and people who are deconditioned that we can, you know, we really can be confident in the numbers that we have. I'll also point out that we, we use really rigorous biological validation. Um, part of the reason that we, we include deconditioned subjects is because most people can't believe these results <laughs> because really MECFS is like the exception to the rule. People with post-exertional symptom exacerbation um, rewrite the exercise physiology textbook. It's really hard to wrap your head around the fact that people can't reproduce an exercise test result. So adding in match control uh, subjects is helpful. You know, there are, there are big differences in measurements between patients uh, uh, with, with post-viral fatigue, MECFS, and, and people who are deconditioned. Uh, but on the first test, uh, they, you know, people with MECFS do not perform as, as high. Uh, and on the second test, they perform even worse, uh, as we'll kind of see schematically here in a moment. So this is where uh, a lot of a lot of the the poor uh, PTs and, and PT students in the audience will kind of start to um, eyes will roll back in their head and they'll have flashbacks of exercise physiology. But I promise I will make this I will make this nice because uh, we'll talk a little bit about bioenergetics and and, and bioenergetic pathways in order to uh, kind of understand what's coming next. So the first um, the first substrate that you use when you first start exercising is the immediate and short-term uh, energy sources, such as the phosphocreatine cycle, uh, as well as metabolize, uh, glycolysis of intramuscular uh, uh, glucose. So you start taking apart the glucose that's already there. And then as you go for a while, you go what's into what's called the tri tricarboxylic uh, acid cycle. We used to call it the Krebs cycle. Uh, and so that's, that is, you know, oxidative metabolism. You're using oxygen to basically burn glucose. Uh, and then finally, um, you have another way that you can burn, um, you basically can create glucose again from lactic acid, uh, which is useful uh, to be able to, to continue uh, working, uh, even in the absence of sufficient oxygen. So the way this comes about is that your immediate and short-term energy systems start from the start of exercise to about two minutes, uh, net about one, one ATP at a time. They're not super efficient. You're just burning what's already there. Uh, and you're kind of just biding time until you get into the long-term energy system or the aerobic energy system, which uses glucose, uh, is very complex, mediated by many different metabolites, and it nets 36 ATP. So this is a big, this is big energy source uh, until you run out of the ability to take in enough oxygen or the mitochondria can't take in enough oxygen. So then at the very end, uh, you have a high intensity energy system, which uses lactic acid to convert lactic acid to glucose, but notice you're in the deficit now. So whereas before you were kind of just using what was there, you were getting like the big guns going here for 36 ATP at a time here, it actually costs you more uh, more ATP or more energy uh, than it than it than it produces, and so it's not efficient. You cannot maintain it. Um, it literally is, you know, the last resort to help you get a meal or help you help keep you from being a meal. <laughs> so you have you have that to go on, uh, but that's basically at the very end of the task, and you're generating hydrogen ions. So you're basically acidifying your internal body environment when you're using that high intensity energy system. So just a really quick um, overview of pH homeostasis. Again, pH is the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. Your body functions need a, a window of pH. It's about 7.35 to 7.45. And um, there's a really important chemical reaction that happens in your blood and in your red blood corpuscles uh, where um, your hydrogen ions are buffered by bicarbonate here to create carbonic acid here that you breathe off as carbon dioxide and water in the lungs. And so essentially by adding more hydrogen ions, you drive the reaction this way to breathe off more CO2 and more uh, breath condensation. So this is a very important, um, uh, very important equation that's going on in your body at every minute. So what, what happens during exercise? Well, if we take the volume of oxygen that your body is consuming, 
it kind of goes up linearly with your ventilation. So you're able to keep your, your breathing, you breathe faster, you bring in more oxygen until there's like a break point. And that break point is when you start ventilating more, but you're actually not consuming quite as much of the oxygen. You're just trying to buffer the acid environment that's happening in your body. So generally speaking, we're thinking, you know, before that break point, life is good. Uh, it might be challenging, but life is good. And it starts feeling challenging right around that break point. And then after that break point, when you're just trying to buffer, uh, it's getting really hard and you're not going to be able to do it that much longer. Uh, and so this is the, this is basically what we see during an exercise task. These are actually my colleagues at the WorkWell Foundation testing a, testing a client. This pattern is associated with blood lactic acid levels. And so it, blood lactic acid levels tend to kind of creep up and increase at first until, a, until that break point hits. And then you have a, a significant amount of, of, of blood lactate. And so here are those hydrogen ions again. The hydrogen ion concentration is coming, is coming up. Your, your body, uh, internal body environment, pH is dropping because it's becoming more acidic. So this is what typically happens during a, uh, the first test is we see this pattern that we just discussed. And on the second pattern, you see second day, you see the same pattern that we just discussed. Uh, these even though these tests are separated by just 24 hours apart. But with people who have post-exertional symptom exacerbation or post-exertional malaise, we see a decline in that, that break point, that ventilatory anaerobic threshold break point. Um, and we see a shortening of the test so the shortening of the test, and we see a shift over of all of these zones to be shorter, and we see the test duration decrease. It's just it's just a different different life, different a different um, different performance altogether. So what happens when the body environment becomes acidic? Well, you get headaches. That sounds kind of familiar. Maybe sleepiness and confusion may be familiar. Loss of consciousness sounds kind of familiar, but even coma and seizures. You see weakness, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, shortness of breath and coughing, arrhythmias. All these seem really like kind of post-exertional symptom exacerbation. Um, and so, you know, it's possible that this is a this is a response to consistently functioning in that aerobic environment or that anaerobic environment, I should say. So your lungs increase the breathing rate, again, to expel the, C the carbon dioxide and expel the water. Um, and that's a fast response. And then over time, your kidneys sort of say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we need more bicarbonate uh, so that we can buffer more of those hydrogen ions and that's more of a slow response. And so over time, you see this cat and mouse game happening uh, between the respiratory uh, compensation and the renal compensation. So let's get into a little bit deeper dive for the volume of oxygen and workload, which are slightly different um, variables. But it, so we see a significant reduction in the volume of oxygen consumed uh, at that, that break point, on, especially on the second cardiopulmonary exercise test. And if we just looked at VO2 and workload um, at that break point, uh, you know, when, at that break point between basically aerobic and in anaerobic metabolism, we can correctly classify 95% of patients with CFS and 90% of matched sedentary control subjects. So here we talk about no biomarkers. We need a biomarker, um, you know, acknowledging the significant challenges and issues associated with cardiopulmonary exercise testing. This seems like the closest biomarker we may have in order to just to, to characterize patients. So another quick summary, people with, with ME-CFS, uh, people with post-exertional symptom exacerbation enter anaerobic metabolism earlier and in, at a lower volume of oxygen consumed than people who are deconditioned. The physiology looks different. And the effect is greater on the second test of a two-day CPET. And what this suggests is that the aerobic system dysfunction increases with prior physical activity. So this is activity-dependent um, dysfunction of the aerobic energy system. Uh, and that the rapid effects may be uh, masked a little bit better over time by the kidneys. So a really useful analogy for patients is that of a, a hybrid car, a plug-in hybrid. Um, and apologies if you know, if you have a hybrid car, you probably know way more about this than I do. But um, basically you've got the battery, 
that run battery that runs the motor and you've got uh, you've got an internal combustion engine. So you've got a gas motor. Uh, so you've got two different energy systems to this car. And the battery is great for things like, you know, tooling around town, being on flat surfaces. Uh, but by the time you get to freeway speeds or need to haul something or go up a hill, the gas motor kicks in. And the gas motor also can charge the battery. So now imagine that you had a hybrid car that didn't have a reliable gas motor. What do you lose? You lose the ability for long sustained activity, powerful activity to be able to get up and down hills and drive fast, as well as the chance to recharge your battery. So it really looks like the relationship in the body between the long-term energy system and the intermediate and short-term energy systems. So you know the, the, the risk here, of course, is that we end up at the side of the road uh, because the battery bonks, uh, because we don't have a reliable gas motor. So how do we start providing care? Uh, I've got about a few more minutes here, so I wanna make sure to go over that. Um, we think based on the evidence that we've gathered over time, this is a summary of about four different studies, there are some, some questions you can ask to try and find out whether somebody may have post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation. And the first is, does it take more than one day to recover to your usual baseline after you've had a busier day or increase in your activity level? Do you feel unwell, weak, don't sleep well, or have pain when recovering from activity? Um, if it, yes to, uh, to three or more of those is highly predictive. Uh, and then finally, are you feeling limited in your ability to do normal activity act tasks after, uh, after you know, high activity days or high activity times? And does exercise or activity positively affect you? So if it's yes to the first and no to the second, you're, you're thinking post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation until proven otherwise. The DePaul symptom questionnaire is also useful as a more exhaustive characterization of, of PEM. Uh, symptoms, uh, although uh, these are good screening questions, at least to kind of get the ball rolling. So um, I wish we could probably talk 45 minutes just on this, but there's so many overlaps between chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Is, is it one? Is it the other? Is it both? There's actually a few studies out there that have looked at this. Uh, there are There's some overlap in the case definitions, uh, which is why it is that I've kind of gone away a little bit from MECFS and long COVID and fibromyalgia labels uh, in, uh, in the research end of this, because I'm, I'm kind of most interested in characterizing people with post-exertional symptom responses versus people who don't uh, in order to try and get it a little bit more of the physiology. But there's, so there may be some shared physiology across groups um, that may transcend some of the case definition labels that we currently have. So more, um, more on that later. So in terms of management, we start with kind of pacing self-management and then uh, we, and then after a trial of pacing, after a significant amount of time of pacing self-management where people really understand their activity triggers, they understand what helps them uh, recover from a crash, only then do we move on to exercise interventions. And so it's a very much less is more approach, which is not sort of the way physical therapists are geared to think. We're, we're kind of thinking more is more. Just load it, hashtag, just load it. Um, and if we just load it, of course, uh, we could push someone into a post-exertional flare or crash, and we don't want to do that. Um, and through the less is more approach, what we see is more patient empowerment, and we see a more predictable fund of energy that people have during the day. And they're able to make more informed decisions about how to spend their energy and when they know they need to push themselves into a crash because they just can't avoid it, but they know how long that's gonna be and what, 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 what it will take to, uh, to get back to a baseline before moving forward. So we think about this as energy system first aid. So similar to casting a, uh, a fractured bone, uh, we know that we need to stabilize that internal environment first. And if we stabilize the bone, why can't we stabilize an energy system kind of in, the, in a similar way by, by not using it um, and, 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 and making informed choices about when to use it? Uh, we know that over time, there may be atrophy and other issues surrounding that, uh, that we'll need to address later. So we don't think that this is curative, uh, unfortunately, but we do think that this is a good way for people to adapt uh, and be able to um, use the energy systems that work. And so correspondingly, we, you, we have, we've seen this with stop, rest, and pace uh, for people working with uh, folks who have long COVID, as Daria has already pointed out, uh, the World Physiotherapy 
uh, has some great resources translated into multiple languages, especially that briefing paper number nine. Um, and then also, um, you know, a, a recent blog post we put out in uh, JOSPT talking about staying within your energy envelope, staying within your energy balance through pacing, um, projecting, uh, and, um, um, and planning. Heart rate monitoring can be helpful for people who have post-exertional symptom exacerbation. You're basically trying to find that switch point between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, which is that kind of went over uh, in a ventilatory sense, but we can find the, the heart rate at which that happens. Generally speaking, it's about 60% of uh, age-predicted heart rate. Um, and for um, we, we usually do a 5% buffer, so about 55% of age-predicted maximum heart rate. So this provides people with a um, kind of the magic eight ball to be able to say, hey, you know, um, I'm doing this certain activity. Uh, am I under my threshold? Um, my colleagues and I also have put out a more conservative um, estimate of rest plus 15 beats, which is based on our observations of uh, hundreds of exercise tests. Um, and the most conservative pro of approach really is to aim for a lower heart rate and then titrate upward in order to prevent a crash. The last thing you want to do is someone have someone put on all the work and expense to monitor their heart rate, but um, you know, end up being too high anyway. Um, you can still do this with beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers tend to blunt heart rates above ventilatory anaerobic threshold, so that's great. And the art here is to try and figure out um, you know, if, if a person has coexisting POTS, um, the, the art is to figure out what are spurious beats related to position changes versus what are beats that are metabolically relevant. And this is where having an experienced practitioner to, um, to help go over the data with you is very helpful. Certain activities are going to be harder on, on some days than others because you'll exceed that ventilatory anaerobic threshold, which will have dropped after an exertion day. So again, pacing, changing positions, getting towards supine, um, uh, joint protection and activity planning are really important interventions. There are various different energy saving tips. I love talking with my OT colleagues because my gosh, they just have such good ideas. And here are some that we've learned over time uh, in terms of uh, being able to, to save, uh, save some energy, save some beats on that heart rate monitor. And um, you know, once the once the patient is able to uh, you know achieve a stable baseline, satisfactory baseline of daily functioning, um, you know, it's okay to consider exercise. Uh, consider exercise that is movement from which the patient recovers that's restorative, not that takes away. Uh, we don't want to exercise to the exclusion of daily activities. Prescribe the program again to optimize their function and to pay back with breath work. Um, and then you know, our therapeutic progression really is education and breathing, which is where we spend most of our time. Uh, stretching with anaerobic conditioning, dose control, interval training, and maintenance are really the other three stages. Uh, but really the education and breathing, I think, are the critical steps to, to help people get started. People feel more empowered. There's less of a need to cope with activities. Uh, there's an improved self-reported quality of life and a sense of control over one's uh, own uh, life and one's own situation. Uh, that come from uh, the program when it's working. And then moving beyond, um, again, that careful exercise progression within the energy envelope as the patient is able. Pharmacologic support for symptoms is, is often helpful. Uh, and then also treating the disease, using the research that is emerged for some of these emerging hypotheses that Darius talked about. And there's been so many hypotheses over my um, dozen years of working in this field um, that uh, I, tend to, I tend to not play favorites, <laughs> be a little careful with the emerging data that's come forward uh, because I've seen some uh, work out and I've seen many not. So um, we're, we're always, always careful and, and looking for replication. So that's what I have. I'm afraid I ran a couple minutes over. I apologize because uh, that cuts into Q&A, but here's the way you can reach me. Uh, email is great. I apologize in advance for my Twitter, uh, and I'd love to entertain questions. All right, well, thank you, Todd. It's always great to hear you talk, and even with exercise physiology, where I have some 
bad flashbacks to all the things I should know better. <laughs> um, okay, so we do have some questions. Um, I'm going to start with Mac McCoy. Do you see this related or connected to the substantially higher cardiovascular risks for COVID survivors in the year following illness? It's so COVID, we're trying to get a handle on COVID. And uh, I know probably the most about long other conditions. In treating folks who've been involved, you know, sort of had symptoms and, and disablement impairment for a long time. Um, and so we're, we're trying to get our arms around what this looks like. I think COVID is sort of its own, its own beast. We, we didn't talk in the, we didn't talk so much about cardio, cardiac responses. Again, we could probably do another 45 minutes on that. Um, and, and what we infer from kind of neuroimmune cardiac control. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of a different follow of wax than, than what you're talking about. Um, so we definitely do see, um, you know, unusual cardiac responses to exercise that come up in people with long, all kinds of things. Um, but that the, the cardiovascular risks that we're seeing with long COVID seem to be, uh, seem to be unique. Okay, thank you. And then Louise um, Trewern just would like to share that she li lives with fibromyalgia. And some days I can walk up my hill no problem. And then other, another day it's like every step feels like I'm trying to wade through treacle. After, I don't know what that is. Someone will have to tell me later. Um, oh, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. That would be hard. Um, after 40 plus years living with this, I've realized there's no rhyme or reason to it. Um, and I think that, I don't know, that your talk really kind of explained why that might be happening. At least why we think it might be happening. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I hope it provides a little bit of clarity. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, my gosh, this, the, the rule for symptom responses is, is that it depends. Uh, it varies. And so really um, you know, sit, sitting down and, and having the chance to, to kind, of, kind of log and, and, and sort of appreciate the, the cause and effect relationships is, is hard to do by yourself. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's definitely, hopefully, hopefully this helped a little bit. Okay, we have time for more. So I'm gonna read the next one, but then more people with questions, feel free to add them. I'm from Matt Scarsbrook, who's here. With Todd's chart for when to start exercise intervention, do we have any idea what might be happening physiologically in the third and fourth quartiles that make exercise or load more manageable? How does this compare to deconditioned cohorts? So good, so that's a good question. Um, and so, the, so there's kind of two observations in there. The first one was what's happening with the third and fourth stages that makes exercise better. And then the second one is how does it, how does it relate to deconditioned people? Well, deconditioned people don't need that first step at all. Um, you know, deconditioned folks can get up and going, they will feel tired. Um, I can speak as a deconditioned person myself. <laughs> 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 when I start exercising again, I am not sure that I appreciate uh, what's happening um, and not sure it's a, I wonder why it was a good idea, but over time that gets better. Mm -hmm. um, and with people who have this kind of more neuroimmune presentation, uh, MECFS, long COVID, long other things, um, you, you see a, a totally different physiological response where you just don't have an energy system that's working well. Um, why it is that, that it happens, uh, again, we don't have a lot of solid research data. We followed one person uh, who kind of followed our protocol. So it was a case study and we followed her for a year. Uh, and even though she was doing less, when she came back, her exercise test results were better, which you wouldn't expect in someone who is deconditioned. So there is, you know, at least evidence from that one case that, you know, we see physiological improvement. And my sense is it probably has to do with that first aid concept, which is to say that we're using the energy system that works, we're, we're, we're allowing the other energy system that's unreliable to sort of reload, uh, to, to sort of heal, we're not accessing it repetitively, um, and, and we're seeing improvement. Um, the, one of the... Um, one of the analogies that we use uh, that I think is useful, and we might have to blog about this, is uh, overtraining, uh, overreach, uh, functional overreach syndrome. So if you take an athlete and you overtrain them, 
Um, you know, the, the way you treat that is not through more exercise. The way you treat that is through rest. Um, and so, you know, that, and, and we see functional improvement based on the rest and symptomatic improvement based on resting. So we think that might have something to do with it, but the important difference between an athlete who's overtrained and a person with long, a long syndrome, a post-viral syndrome, for example, is they don't have a normal aerobic energy system to rely on. So, um, you know, they're, we're, we're back, maybe back to a, a similar situation where we started, where we might be able to back up and progress the athlete in a different way. Okay, thank you. Now one from David Poulter. Great information. Thanks so much, Todd. Question, any thoughts on the concept of mitochondrial hijacking and post-exertional malaise during, um, with long COVID? Yeah, I mean, I certainly, I mean, there's something going on. And, you know, it's entirely possible that, you know, the mitochondria are having to multitask, <laughs> you know, metabolism with, with viral replication. Um, and and that's, that's possible. Um, and so it kind of gets back to Daria's idea about viral persistence. Um, there are some metabolomics studies that are just getting underway with, uh, with MECFS. And, and I, I am really working hard to understand this stuff because I did not go far enough in biochemistry to understand this. But, um, but I have smart people around me who explain stuff to me, and I, I'm always grateful for that. And I, I don't know if they've done any specific sort of virological studies on, on, on that, but I, I will do some additional reading and maybe I'll reach out by the, by the BIRD app. It's a good question. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, now one from Lisa Van Hoos. Um, are you or one of your partners looking at the role of um, NF-kappa beta pathway in your findings? There is increased activation with COVID and could acute initial exercise be causing an additive effect? Could we look at inflammatory profile and anaerobic threshold correlations? It, it is possible. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's, it's definitely possible because um, we do see some aberrant immune responses. In fact, the CM and ME CFS, um, the, 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 there's a group think at the University of Utah that has looked at that over time with an exercise task that's a little bit different than CPET. So we're not really comparing apples with oranges. Apples with apples are comparing apples with oranges. Um, and they've done some, um, some comparison of control subjects, deconditioned people um, with people who have uh, post-viral syndrome and, and found some, some differences in uh, immune response to exercise. I'm not sure if that particular pathway was one that they looked at, but the, but I know that there are some some differences in humoral immunity, humoral immunity that have that have come forward with like the interleukin cascade. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now one from Marcos Lopez. Uh, did mention the movie Unrest for those people who are interested, in maybe a Netflix um, film, kind of talking about this topic. But then his question is. When they are ready for progressive exercise, do you recommend using the heart rate monitoring plus 15 of rest, 60% um, RPE less than something? Yeah, good question. So um, I still use the heart rate monitor. Generally speaking, at that point, it's I'm using the 55% threshold. Um, and you can imagine that exercise doesn't look much like exercise. I mean, it looks very light. Um, you know, we're doing stretching and breathing, a lot of stretching and breathing to start off with. And, that, and that's enough exercise for people. Um, and um, you know, so that's, that's sort of where we start. We start with a, with a very low level. The patient that you saw that was doing step training uh, was, a, was a very um, kind of later stage patient that, that had been working with us for a while, uh, like over a year, uh, and uh, had a less, less sort of involved um, presentation, less, less sort of severe functional limitations. And so we were, uh, we were able to progress her that far. But I would say that, you know, of in my practice where I see people with MECFS and long COVID, I spend the vast majority of my time with energy system first aid. Okay, thank you. Um, and I did just see one, um, there's a little conversation going on about um, in the chat, let me find it. Um, it might be a bigger question than could be discussed in two minutes, but uh, Aria asks about 
that she's had chronic low back pain for five plus years due to injury. Pain seems to disappear for minutes, hours, or even days after some car 10 minutes of cardiovascular exercise. Um, heartbeat up to 120. Um, heat or hot shower also can help. And was asking kind of the group, but since it came up during this, I thought I would ask it. Um, any hypotheses as to why that might help? I imagine we're going to have many. I'm going to leave that to the wisdom of the group. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good uh, a good fireside chat around uh, around s'mores. I don't know. That might be best best left for a broader conversation. But I, I'd certainly appreciate the question. I couldn't have created a better segue too. Thank you, Todd, for that discussion. And then I'll talk about the s'mores some more. So <laughs> All right.